This is the Conscious Radio Network. All right. Welcome to Conscious Radio Network's podcast series, Unlocking Mysteries of the Universe. I'm your host, Reverend Dr. Paul Meckes. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you might be on this spaceship we call Earth. If you're new to this f- ship or fleet, please click subscribe, like, share, and comment. You can also listen to the series on Lipson, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcast, and soon-to-be Apple Podcast for a Starbase near you. This evening, David Edward knows where Atlantis is and has proven it in his book, Atlantis Solved, The Final Definitive Proof. A former U.S. military special agent, His fun and energetic interviewing brings facts and logic to where is often a fringe topic. He's published over 40 books, evenly split between historical fiction and nonfiction, including his best-selling thriller, Panama Red. The first book in a series has sold over 100,000 copies. He holds four graduate degrees, including a doctorate in engineering, and hosts a weekly podcast on the writing industry, that often receives as many as 30,000 views per episode. Let's welcome tonight, Dave Edwards. Welcome. All right. Yeah, that's a, that's a big audience. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, they're Dr. Paul. They are very well behaved right up until then. Yeah, right. They got all wild. <laughs> they want to know about Atlantis. Oh, yeah. So, um, I'm not sure how far we want to go back, um, staying on the topic of, of uh, the Atlantean subject. Um, what, what grabbed your attention? What first grabbed your attention on, on wanting to work and, and, and research this? Sure. Well, you know, I'm, I, I, was, I was born a nerd. I think I was one of the first nerds ever born. Um, so growing up, and I'm an old, old guy, so growing up in the 70s and, uh, and the 80s, you know, I watched every uh, TV show that there was on this. It's not like today where there's a lot more media on it. It was a very big deal when uh, one of those shows came on the equivalent of the Discovery Channel or something. So I watched those. I read all the books, you know, Aaron Von Danigan's uh, oh, Chairs yeah. of the Gods, all that stuff. I mean, I was like super nerdy into this. Um, and it didn't, you know, those, those shows don't really lead anywhere. They're, they're interesting. And none of the books in the 70s or 80s really led anywhere. So as I got older and I, you know, and I was in the military, you, you read some of that and you got to read something. So I would just read Plato and Herodotus and some of the, the ancient Greek literature because I was fascinated, you know, you know, by all of it. So yeah. I did all that. I've actually taken, I, I'm credentialed. I could teach ancient history if, in, a, in a college program if, if I wanted to. I've so taken a bunch of college classes on, on top of my other degrees and stuff, but I never, it never did anything with it and, it. and it faded from my mind. Um, then maybe a year ago, uh, I had I had listened to and watched all the uh, conscious radio network YouTube videos I could possibly watch. I watched them five or six or seven times. So, so I was kind of <laughs> out of I was out of content. So I'm an old guy. You know, I can't sleep. I'm, I've watched all your stuff, uh, which is, you know, wildly entertaining and, and really felt filled the time well. But since I started flipping around, I saw this guy, uh, Jimmy Corsetti. He has a, a channel called Bright Insight and his kind of claim to fame in 2018 is he had run across this thing called the Rishat structure or the eye of the Sahara, much nicer name, which is in Western um, Africa. And he has a bunch of videos saying, Hey, this looks a lot like Atlantis. So I was kind of, you know, reawakened to the topic and and I'm a prolific writer. Uh, So as you mentioned, I've written a ton of books. I've written, I have a whole uh, series of books on on the history of different places. And so I decided, and and, and when I watched Jimmy's videos, he got a lot of stuff right, but some of the stuff he didn't get right. He's, you know, some of the names he said wrong and, and some of the uh, uh, geology and and, and the history just, it wasn't perfect. He's like 85, 90%. So I was like, but I thought it was, I thought he was onto something. So I just decided to independently go after it. And when I, and, and I decided to take, you know, a very, uh, you mentioned I've, I've got some advanced degrees. I have a, a degree in engineering. So I wanted to take a very formal scientific approach because all those shows I mentioned, and even the ones today still, you know, there's, there's probably a show on Atlantis done every year, maybe more than one. And, oh, yeah. and the format is all kind of the same. The first half of the show, they kind of set you up. You, you, the people in it, 
Um, they're good looking people. They get to go to the beach and they have, they're on this wonderful travel journey of the Greek islands and beautiful blue water. And they're telling you they got it all figured out. And then that's about the first half of the show. Then the second half of the show, they show you some places. They kind of tell you if this was it, you know, we got to dismiss this. We got to change that. We got to assume Plato was wrong on this or that. And then by the end of it, they've identified three or four places. They had a great travel vacation, but they didn't, but they didn't solve anything. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to take a different approach, uh, which is what I did in the book is I, I started from what we call the source material from Plato. And I just started from, I, I put everything to the side and I started from scratch, um, because Plato gives us a lot of measurements and stuff. And then I kind of worked it up into what became the book Atlanta solved. Yeah. Yeah. And then definitely, yeah. Using an, uh, an engineering perspective. I, I grew up, I, I was raised in a, a family of engineers scientific minded and i looked i like to look at facts i like to look yeah. at data and and analyze it and yeah you know you, you got to criticize stuff you know and everybody out there's a critic <laughs> well everyone's a critic and, and there are people like even jimmy and there's um what's the guy's name uh randall carlson he's kind of hot in this area he has a different answer then you've yeah. got graham hancock and, and there's just there's a, there's a list of, of, of well-known um people uh, when it comes to space, but they all do what kind of bugs me as, as, a, as a nerd, which is so half of the stuff they say is like the most brilliant thing I never thought of and, and hadn't heard. But then they'll start talking about power crystals or UFOs or, yeah. um, you know, stuff that just doesn't line up with what we know about history. And the other thing that they typically do is they have this term they use and they call it mainstream. And they'll say mm. that the, the mainstream historians, or they say the mainstream academics, don't believe this or don't believe that. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not a fan of mainstream. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in this space, my, my thought was, let's see if we can get something that lines up to what everyone agrees. So we don't have to have any leaps of faith. We don't have to criti criticize an academic who believes that the, the, the agriculture started in 10,000 BC and the pre-pottery -potter, Neolithic started in 9,600 BC. You know, you know, let's find what they say about this time and about yeah. this area. And then let's see what primary sources we have. And we only have one, Plato, but, but I did find two supporting what we would call um, you know, ancillary sources. And then and let's just figure it all out and, and see how close we can get. And what I do in the book is, is I put a, a checklist together just to basically all the requirements going from, you know, what we know about the historical period through specifically what Plato says literally. And by the time you get through that on the book, this Rishat structure thing matches what we know about what Atlantis could be by like 99.3%. I mean, yeah. it, it's so much so that it's beyond a circumstantial case. You know, it's impossible that Plato would have guessed about something in the middle of Africa that he had never heard of or seen. He just made it up, but yet it matches perfectly to everything we know and, and could know about that time period and about this place. So it's, 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 if this isn't Atlantis, then there isn't one there. there yeah. Cause I even opened the book. I say, look, if some, something can be anything, you know, can, can we ever accept it as just something? Because, yeah. you know, if you, if you type in Atlantis, Atlantis can be anything, right? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I've had people tell me, you know, it's the moon, it's the earth. Um, it's China. Uh, it's uh, somewhere in the Pacific. Uh, it's the friends you meet along the way, you know, whatever. Mm. So, uh, so, but I, but I think specifically this Rishat structure, um, very much is whatever Plato was talking about that he called Atlantis. Yeah. Um, have you, have you been working out in, a, have you been out in the field doing, um, you know, assisting any archeological, you know, getting, basically getting your hands dirty and going, yeah, let me, let me go check this out. Let me go scuba diving for a moment and see if I can find something. Or, yes. Yeah, although we're, we're in the Western Sahara, so scuba diving would be an awkward experience. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I've got, I've got two people that I'm working with behind the scenes. One is a geologist because I want, um, I'm looking, you know, basically we're looking at rocks, so I need someone mm -hmm. who, can, who can tell me about the rocks. And, and they've actually we've discovered some interesting things. And the other guy, his name's David Stig Hansen. He has his own YouTube channel. He does his own things, but, but he actually went there a year and a half ago and he's going back in October and I've been coordinating with him. There's a couple of experiments we're going to do. There's some specific places we want to look at. We're going to collect some uh, rock samples so we can um, run some analysis on them. Uh, but yeah, we're taking a very much, and we've got lots of contacts in the area, but yeah, so people on my team have been there once already and we're going back in uh, just next month or two months from now. Yeah. How big is your team? 
Uh, that's the, that's it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, we got an entourage. <laughs> yeah, so I ate three, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you go. Hey, yeah, I, that's the magic power of three right there, my friend. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, have you noticed, uh, before we get really raw into things, um, mm -hmm. have you noticed any, I mean, there's, there's so much of this information that's prehistoric. And you re we really can't go off of any data other than that we capture it you know, from physical evidence, providing that there is some. And there, throughout history, I mean, especially in the last 10 years since I've been doing, you know, some of my own research when it comes to certain timelines, that now science and archaeology is starting to show that, oh, boy, we got that really wrong, you know, about dating the pyramids and dating the, you know, some of these archaeological sites. And it's like, wow, this is much older. Yeah. than it really is have you seen any contradictory of what we have been told um in the age of poss how far back atlantis actually goes compared to what we possibly think yeah let, let's talk about that um so I'll, I'll try and be clear when i'm reciting the um uh, the analysis and the outcome of what i did with the book and the requirements and all of that because 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 that is science in fact I, I did it specifically in the book I, I outline the methodology and then i and then i make it so that everyone can go look at everything i looked at and look at it themselves and reach their own conclusion because that is science right it's, it's the ability yeah. to, to, re to repeat that so that's we'll put that over here we'll call that we'll, we'll put that over here on my left side and on my right side i'm i'm willing to to guess and speculate about stuff like you just asked me but i, I try and be very clear when i'm talking you know which side of my mouth I'm talking about the science side or yeah. the what I what I believe based on what I've seen side um and I have the whole I, I think I have a pretty good feel for what our history really looks like at least back to about 10,000 BCE um yeah. we, we can argue about patterns of cataclysms and and how long some of this stuff has been going on but again that's theory where the stuff about Atlantis that, that we can talk about is is is, is fact, and, and people can look at it. They can, they cannot like the facts. They can interpret them differently, but but they are facts. So yeah. speculating, what I think is is that Atlantis provides us a, a real good benchmark, and in, in the time period is 9600 BCE, and, and we can talk about how we get to that date. It corresponds to stuff we know that everyone talks about the Younger Dryas and, and all you know, which is the end of the last ice age. Um, and it can fit in very well to what is the accepted um, interpretation of what was going on in that time. And I'll get into that. I have, I have all those facts for you. Um, between then and, say, you know, the Bronze Age, which is like 1300 B.C., you know, we've got 8,000 years. Yeah. And, not, and, people, and that goes to, you know, not a lot of people know what was going on then. Um, I do think, and I'm totally speculating, so I'm being a nerd kook, uh, that, Oh, and I'm like a big uh, Brian Forrester, Forrester fan. Um, <laughs> you know, and I watch, I probably watch one of his videos a day where he walks around and I, I kind of know his speech now. But basically, it looks like the foundation to a lot of these um, places, like the pyramids, a lot of the places in, in Peru, it looks like there's, there's been multiple instances of civilization building onto them. And yeah. it seems like the farther down you go into the foundations, the more advanced uh, or at least the bigger the stones are and, and the more preci precision that has been used to place and cut them. So it yeah. seems like we're dealing with at least two or three instances of um, uh, civilization forming, doing something with stones, going away for some reason, then another civilization coming back and not quite having that same level of engineering technology. Um, but, 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 you know, building on to the, the same site, you know, Troy, which they, which we thought was myth. And then uh, Sleeman found it. Uh, like a hundred years ago, you know, they talk in, about Troy in levels, right? And they'll say, mm -hmm. well, we we found nine levels or eleven levels, and we think we think the Troy of the Iliad w is in level seven. And it's like, okay, that sounds like a smart academic thing, but the real message there is that the, these places where people build stuff, w if something happens, they seem to want to go back to them, and they'll build on top and on top and on top and on top. So a lot of I'm speculating, but a lot of what I think we have dating wise for ancient Egypt and some of the Mesoamerican stuff is that last layer of civilization, which takes us to 1500, you know, 1200 uh, AD. And then in Egypt, we, we push that back to two or 3000 BCE, but, but not much before. Uh, but I think that's just the top layer and that's how it's been interpreted. And those are the dates that keep getting pushed back as they find stuff. Yeah. Um, 
the, the great uh, equalizer was Gobegle Tepe, which I'm oh, sure yeah. you, 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 everyone's in talked Turkey. about. Yeah, in Turkey, yeah. because it, I, I, it, it dates from 9600 BC, which is when Plato tells us Atlantis was destroyed. Um, and it exhibits kind of that missing link between hunter-gatherers and then the ability to start organizing yourself as a society to start to specialize, which is the big thing that happens in civilizations where not everyone has to drag their caveman wife around by her hair and, and eat uh, bam bam ribs, right? <laughs> Pretty soon you got yeah. some people that do that and other people, they got nothing to do. So they can look at the stars, they can write music, they can figure out how to build cool stuff, and they can start those, those that the specialized components of civilization. Um, and and Gobegle typically gives us all of that, where 10 years ago, it, we didn't have that. Even though we knew about Gobegle Tepe, it hadn't been, it hadn't made its way into that mainstream term. But it's yeah. there. They don't know what to do with it, but but they acknowledge it exists and they acknowledge its date. Um, so that gives us a good benchmark that we can use then to look at Atlantis, which is a, would have been a contemporary of whatever was going on there. Yeah. Um, have you um, experienced any um, resistance in your research? Any... Uh second third parties out there gone you know going oh maybe maybe you shouldn't look at this or yeah oh yeah i i, I didn't i did not quite understand the waters i was wading into um when i decided to take a take a side on this to team rishat as they say um and there are people many people believe ha have beliefs that they believe um and hold very close to their heart I, I i equate it to american politics i used to love to argue politics with people you can't do that today. You can't, I don't care what side <laughs> no. of it you're on, you can't even discuss it. <laughs> yeah. But this, but, but, but Atlantis ha has that same energy and has the same passion. Um, uh, but it's not toxic, if you will. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so from a resistance standpoint, they're basically, there's three camps. There's people that feel like this eye of the Sahara Rishat thing is as close as we're going to get. And it lines up pretty good. So they believe it. Um, and then there's, uh, a, and that's Jimmy Corsetti's camp ish there's other people and then you have randall carlson's camp and randall carlson has done a good job of, of um presenting evidence that a lot was going on in this time period more than maybe you know we see in the history books but they they believe it's the atlantic ridge and there's a complicated process of geoglacial rebound and the azor islands and continents coming out of the water and, and stuff but they believe very very passionately and then the third group kind of believes all the other 20 things it's the bimini road in florida or it's cuba or it's south america or i think ireland and there's something yeah. up there that they like um so so yeah so a lot of resistance from all those camps that aren't rishat so like 65 66 percent of the people in this space believe vehemently something else and they don't really want to have their um their uh, view changed and then about a third and that's what i walked in with the, the challenge i have in, in the book it brings a lot of new data because they're very specific criticisms of uh the rishat uh site especially from randall carlson's camp but and i address those in the book and i'm happy to go over those too there's basically five five or six uh things that they say yeah. on on why this can't be it we can get into those too because oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um which uh we might as well. I'm going to ask that question. And here's the big one. Let's get okay. raw, man. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Um, according to your research, um, where do you feel, and according to the proof that you got, that Atlantis originally existed? Yeah. So there is a, um, a thing on the planet Earth called the Sahara Desert. And the Sahara Desert is in kind of north and west Africa, and it's companies like Mali um, and uh, uh, southern Madrid and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the big place it is is in this country called Mauritania, which is just kind of a cool name anyway, Mauritania. Yeah. So it's a country name. Um, but it looks like uh, it, that um, the Rishat structure is in uh, the western Sahara, and this is about 345 miles inland. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's a good thing, by the way, not a bad thing, because we have some stuff in Plato that people tend to ignore. Um, and it, it's a series of concentric circles that uh, match uh, that description. That, that's kind of the, the classic description of Atlantis, right? You have a center island, and then you have uh, two si concentric circles of land and water kind of, kind of going out from it. Yeah. Um, so it matches that. Uh, it matches uh, – Plato gives us about 20 different data points. Um, just specific things that can be measured. Um, and it matches all of them. 
uh, and it matches some of the ge geographical inf uh, area too, like it had hot and cold water. Well, this Rishat thing is, is uh, we, we believe to have been a, um, a volcanic dome. And anywhere volcanoes are, you can get hot and cold water, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but but let, let, let's set it up. So we have the we have the city of Atlantis, which is what this Rishat structure thing is. Then we have the continent of Atlantis. And, and if this is the city, then that makes the continent West Africa. And we can talk about why that's a good fit, not a bad fit, because most people want it to be uh, an island because that's how that's yeah. how it was translated. We. I, I retranslated a, a lot of it too, which I, I go through in the book. I won't, I won't bore us with it. But basically, island is one of the interpretations, and it comes to the question of is Australia an island? Maybe I, I don't. Know, maybe, but it's also it's a continent. It's a lot of yeah. things, right? Yeah. So it. But m what what it mostly is is a big piece of land that sticks out into a big piece of water, which is what Plato is what that word island meant in Plato sometimes. Um, now, when he's talking about the city, it's clearly an island because it, it, this would be a series of islands in a lake that's about 20 miles across, um, which is a pretty good sized lake. But then we have that. And then we have the kingdom of Atlantis, which Plato tells us about, too. And these would be all the other places where we think we found stuff like the Bimini Road. And we, we found stuff in Spain that looked to have a lot of a good agriculture. The Azores have been identified. Um, Cyprus, uh, what Mycenae, not Mycenae, what's it called? Um, uh, I forget the name. It's right off of it's. It's an obvious one. It's the one that everyone yeah. points to. Um, but yeah. But so. It, but he tells it. So he gives us, and this is at the end of it. He gives us. Let's let's work our way from the from the kingdom in. He gives us um, five sets of male twins that he says were were given as the rulers of the various provinces. Yeah. So the first province is the city, the capital, and, and that's King Atlas. Um, now, we also have the Atlas Mountains, by the way, a couple hundred miles to the north of where this Rishat structure is. So uh -huh. a lot of this stuff starts to line up and there's a lot more um, circumstances, you know, you know, beyond that. But then he gives us all these names. And so I've been uh, and I'm working on a second book. I've been frenetically trying to trying to trace the lineage of the names that Plato uses for these twins to see if we can use phonetics to figure out you know, where that might be. Um, it, since we're talking about, you know, a seafaring culture. And he actually says the eldest of the fifth set of twins, his name was Azores. Well, I think that solves then for the Azor Islands, right? Because hmm. there's evidence stuff was going on. Many people think it's Atlantis, but it doesn't, it's not big enough. It doesn't really, it, there's nothing to look at that would say it's, you know, Atlantis proper, the capital. But, yeah. but they found terrace farming. They found what looked like structures that might be underwater and, and the sea level would have been lower then. And Plato tells us that that was one of the provinces, it was, you know. So, um, so I, think, I think it fits in as part of the kingdom, but it's not the capital. The capital is this thing, this Rishat structure in, um, in Western Africa. I've forgotten what question you asked me, so I'll just pause. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, basically, well, like, where, where, where it is. Where it, where yeah. It okay. Was. Yeah. So what? So uh, yeah. So yeah. So it's it's in uh, what, the Western Sahara. It's at about thirty five hundred to four thousand feet elevation, which is one one of the reasons why people think it's not a good place. But I'll uh, yeah. I'll talk about why um why that actually makes it a pretty decent place. Um, the other criticism against it is that it, it looks like it's a volcanic dome, so it was naturally formed. Uh, but nowhere does does Plato say it, it wasn't. Matter of fact, he says that Poseidon created it. So unless we're going to argue that Poseidon was a guy going around digging holes, you know, yeah. he, 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 he meant, you know, Poseidon as, as, you know, the God of the water and the earth and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, Plato, there's a story to it too. Let me, let me tell the story. Let me get back to these criticisms because I want right. to, I want to set the rest of this up. So this, here's the story that Plato tells. Um, he says, he's talking to this guy and this is in a work. There's two works, Critias and Timius are, are these two dialogues. Uh, well, let me back up even farther. Who, who, who the heck was Plato, right? So, so Plato was uh, what we consider today a Greek philosopher. Um, he would have written the Critias and Timaeus uh, as part of dialogues that he wrote um, around 360 BCE. Uh, he, I think he died in 340 something or 330 something BCE. Um, and in this particular one, what, what Plato was trying to do is kind of capture how the Greeks thought about how they would organize their government and plato's view was that it hasn't been done very well and it seems very unfair and it seems like just the bigger stronger people take over and and our injustice is kind of defined by whatever they want and and he is trying to work through all of that and and figure out you know maybe if we were to do this for real how might we do it so a lot of his dialogues focus on 
an exploration of justice. How do you know it? How, you know, we, I mean, we, we still argue with these terms today. How do you know when yeah. you see it? How do you know what the right thing to do is? And then he kind of moves into a little bit more esoteric um, analysis or, or pondering thought experiments of if we were to reset civilization back up, what, what might be a good way to do it? And there's a very famous dialogue that all of us who went to um, an American high school, we carried the book The Republic around with us in 10th grade for probably two months, and none of us read it. Uh, it's a big, <laughs> thick book. Um, but that's his most famous dialogue. And in that, he, there's, there's two key pieces that, that people project over to Atlantis. The first is that he uses an allegory in the, in the Republic of the cave. And what he's trying to explain there is if we all have this idea of what justice is in our head or what a chair is, right? Or, or what a meat, what meatloaf is, whatever, just what stuff is. And then yeah. you have, so you have our idea of it that he calls the form of it. And that's his purest sense, like we, you know, pure justice. And then we have whatever we see and deal with here. You know, we have, meatloaf that we're eating for dinner, which is a different meatloaf than we ate yesterday. We have eight chairs around the table. We have people doing stuff that might be just or unjust. And he says in the cave, he's trying to explain the real world is a shadow of these, these, these higher order concepts um, and, and kind of work through it. And, and, but it's an allegory. And people say, well, if, if the cave was an allegory, then Atlantis is an allegory too, um, which is not. And, and, I, and he tells us it's not. He's very good about telling us that. And then the other thing the, the Republic does, which he does in Critias also, is he imagines what a perfect ruling class and society might look like. Um, and, and the Republic, he tells us, he's thinking about it, he's making it all up. In Critias, he tells us specifically that, that he believes the story of Atlantis to be true. And he get, and he takes the time to give us the chain of custody, the lineage of it. So there's this guy Solon, who was a um, uh, a, a Greek politician in 600 BCE, so a good good couple centuries before Plato. Yeah. Um, and this was at the beginning. So we would call this the um, uh, it's, it's after the Greek uh, Dark Ages. So they're emerging out of the Dark Ages, but they're not quite the classical Greeks that we think of when we see the big pillars and buildings and all that stuff. Um, so Solon's trying to figure out how to be a good politician. He goes to Egypt and talks about all kinds of stuff. One of the things they talk about is Egypt, ancient history. They tell him about Atlantis. He, he works with the priests for months. He writes it all down. What they, what they have is they have time measurements and then they have lots of measurements around uh, the city. Um, and then and the continent and all that stuff. And he, he writes it all down. He takes it back. And then his great, great, great grandson, Critias, reads it. So a lot of people say it's it's word of mouth or oral traditions and how could it be right? But it's not. It, it's written down. He yeah. reads it. And then he's telling Plato or he, he's talking about what that scroll said. And Plato's recording um, what he wrote. And he, the first thing he tells us is that this whole tale took place 9,000 years before they told it to Solon. So 600 BC plus 9,000, it may, puts us in 9,600 BCE, which is how we get that, that date. Yeah. Um, now that date corresponds, here's what was going on on the planet in that date. It was the end of the last ice age. Um, in fact, it was the end of what they call the younger Dryas. And the, the Dryas is a plant that we can find, dig up and, and measure today to, to, to figure out what the temperature was on the planet. So there's actually been three Dryas events, the younger Dryas, which is what we're talking about. And then before that, you have the older Dryas. And before that, just to show you how clever they are, you have the oldest Dryas. Um, and these are just ice ages that, um, yeah. that, that, that the planet went through. So we've got that. And then 9600 uh, BCE in this area, in, in the Mediterranean, we're in what they call the pre-pottery Neolithic. All that means is just before we figured out how to, how to cook mud and make pots out of it. Um, and the Neolithic means new Stone Age. Um, so it's just basically a continuation of the Stone Age after the hard Ice Age, which, which we're coming out of. Uh, and then we know that agriculture, and Gogobegle Tepe helped us with this, but we know in that area, agriculture, we start to see agricultural communities forming about 10,000 BCE, so during the last Ice Age. Mm. Uh, but but 9,600 BCE is 400 years after we start to see agriculture. Um, one of the things Plato tells us about Atlantis is that they're really, really good at agriculture. Um, in fact, the two things he liked most about them was that they were really good at agriculture and they were really good at organizing themselves into what he thought was a pretty fair and just way of running a society. And we can get into what he says about those too. Um, in this part of the Africa, in the Sahara, at this time period, it was what we call the Green Sahara. So it was ample rainfall. We, we, you and I just discovered that we both like Florida more than we would have thought of the other, right? So we're, we're, actually, <laughs> yeah. we're not that far apart. But what do we get here in Florida? We get tons and tons of rain, and it's very green and lush. And we are um, uh, on the parallel 
pretty close to where this Rishat structure is. So this is about probably what the weather would have been like. Now they're higher up, so they would mm -hmm. get a little more of a break from the humidity and stuff. Uh, yeah. But but so that's the time period that we're talking about. Um, now you asked me about stuff on the ground, right? So the people that have gone on ground, and, and we've got lots of pictures of this stuff, is we found tools. We know people were in the area in 9600 BCE, uh, and they are doing exactly what we thought they would be doing. They, they, they're making stone tools, they're making stone pottery, um, and they're living their lives and doing, doing what people do. And they were enough of a society. So we're not just hunter gathering, right? We're, we're, we're doing that next, that next level, which in this time period, um, given the, the remoteness of this place and it's very well protected. So it's almost like when you really look at it and you really put people there um, with no, you know, and they're very well insulated. No one can attack them. The, the predators, especially on these inner islands in the middle of the lake, the predators can't get to them. Uh, they've got ample rainfall. The ground is incredibly fertile. They can grow anything. Why wouldn't they have created a society that, you know, we'll use the word advanced, but we're going to, we're going to quit using that word by the time we're done with this conversation. Um, <laughs> but from Plato's standpoint, and certainly from what we think might've been going on in this time period, they, they were advanced in those ways. Now, they got greedy, just like all societies do, and they started thinking a lot of themselves, and they attacked um, Libya is, and, and conquered Libya as far as Egypt, according to Plato, and parts of uh, Asia, not Asia, Europe, inside of the um, Mediterranean. Uh, hmm. When they got to Greece, and matter of fact, the last twin um, that is given a province, it's a series of islands. I, I don't have the name in front of me. I apologize. But it's a series of islands that are to the east uh, of Greece. So it actually makes complete sense, right? The last guy they give Greece to. And then Plato tells us that the Egyptians told uh, him that the Greeks kind of counterattacked and they kind of beat the Atlanteans back all the way to the, 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 the gates of their capital. And that's when whatever bad happened, happened and the whole thing got wiped out so yeah. we we know the atlanteans were really good at agriculture we we think they're pretty good at organizing themselves but they weren't advanced when it came to warfare because oh. whatever was going on in 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 prehistoric greece whatever those people were doing and we can't even call them greeks people would call them proto-greeks but they were able to beat them they were able to beat them mm -hmm. back so you know so it's not it's, you know, it's no there's no nuclear submarines or ufos i apologize i wish there was <laughs> um but yeah, yeah it's just it's just a bunch of people that got lucky um and and why wouldn't this place in africa why wouldn't africa be where we, we see some of the earlier civilizations given from a dna standpoint it, it is mainstream to believe right now that that humans whatever we are came our dna all of our dna traces back to africa so it just makes sense um, yeah, it, it, it almost is to the point where when you put it all together, you would really have to explain why they wouldn't have found this place and lived on it. It's, it's the best place to live in the world. Um, yeah. so yeah. So, and, uh, and I, I use my imagination all the time and not only that possibly remote viewing, I don't know, but, uh, as, as you were mentioning and talking about, you know, how the Atlanteans were, were conquering these areas as we're moving outward, mm -hmm. you know, I'm imagining going back that far in time that you know compared to today there's not much civilization out in those areas not like that you would see today so there's very little very little civilization that i would assume existed as they're, as they're conquering and moving outward the, um, that's ex that's exactly right so what we what you what you're largely dealing with are tribes of hunter gatherers um and um, groups that are starting to stay in one place and starting to move into this agricultural um, mindset, society, whatever you want to call it, agrarian society. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, when, when you're conquering lands, it's not like today we have these big empires or, or, or city, even city streets. None of that was there. It's just, it's yeah. just groups of people. So, yeah, you could be fairly primitive from, from today's standpoint. Um, but, I mean, you know, Get, getting hit with a, a a sharp stick still hurts. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 two, they, whatever nomadic tribes are in those outer areas that are you know being invaded by the Atlanteans are obviously going. Well, you got better technology than we do. You know, if you're bringing technology to us, all yeah. right, we we submit. <laughs> well, yeah, we said we submit or run away. I mean, they're yeah, not going to chase exactly. you very far. I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, just I mean, you go go ten miles inland up the hill and watch them until they leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and that is exactly that's exactly what we're we're talking about here, actually. And 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 that is 
and, and so far, everything that has been said, including this location, doesn't contradict anything. It doesn't yeah. contradict any mainstream view of anything. It, 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 pushes, it pushes it around a little bit, but it all fits within the framework of what we think we know. Um, yeah. Now, but, but, but why, this, why is this location so interesting to people? Why do, why do people, when they really study it, well, why do they start to think this Rishat Strusher thing has more to offer than some of these other places, like the Bimini Road or, uh, you know, any any other places? And, and that is because Plato gives us, he gives us like 20, I call them requirements. So what I do in the book is um, I go through, I, I, I give you all the dialogues where Plato talks about this thing. And then I decompose each one and I break it down into a requirement. And I say, okay, well, he says that, um, he says that there was a, a, a river, or he says that there was a the city was on a, a gently sloping plain to the sea of three thousand stadia with mountains to the north in an oblong shape something very, very very close to that. So yeah. okay, well that's the requirement then. So now we got to figure out what a stadia is because we got to figure out what three thousand of them are. But then we need a place that's sitting three thousand stadia up a, a gently sloping plain to the sea with mountains to the north um, and open to the south and whatever whatever else he said. Uh, well, a stadia. And we're taught we're dealing with the what they call the Alexandrian measure of a stadia. Uh, mm -hmm. Alexander the Great was born like 12 years before Plato died, and, and there's actually a lineage there. We we get we go from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, which we can talk about. And Aristotle tutors Alexander the Great, but it turns out that the Alexandrian measure of a stadia is 607 feet. So okay, so okay, fine. So that's what it is. So that's what we got. That's what we. So all these measurements are in stadia. So when we hear them, we got to translate them into something we can understand. So it turns out if you multiply six hundred and seven times three thousand and divide it by five thousand eight hundred twenty, which is how many feet are in a mile, you get three hundred forty-five miles. Hmm. Okay, cool. We can see where Plato wrote that. We can uh, look up a stadia and we can get to that measurement, and then. God bless the internet, we can go to Google Earth or, or Maps or whatever, and we can hit measure, and then we can, and it even equates, it, it brings in the curvature of the Earth, we can see, well, well how far is this Rishat structure from the sea? Yeah. Do, do you know how far it is? Uh -oh. I just told you, it's 345 miles. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a trick question. I do that. It's a setup. I say, yeah. I say, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah. it's like, okay, all right, okay. So, and, 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 and by the way, everyone ignores that line because mm -hmm. it's inconvenient for every other place that has ever been said to be Atlantis. It can't be the, it can't be the Azor Islands. It's not 345 miles from side to side, you know, much less yeah. up, up a gently sloping plain. The Bimini Islands, everywhere, it doesn't, doesn't fit. But this Rishat thing, it fits. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. Now he says there are mountains to the north and it was open to the south. Well, when you look at it, sure enough, there are mountains to the north and it's open to the south. He says hmm. that they dug a canal. 100 feet wide, 100 feet deep. No, 300 feet wide, 100 feet deep, 50 stadia from the outer um, ring where uh, he uses the word sea, but, th but that's just water from, from where it hit inside the lake and where it hits the water to uh, an inner harbor. Well, yeah. 50 stadia, when you multiply it by 607 feet, it comes out to like 5.8 miles. Huh. Well, how far is it from the outer ring to the tip of the inner ring of the Rishat structure? 5.8 miles. Yeah. Um, now, wh when I looked at it with the geologists, what we what we found was that you know whenever we see a picture of Atlantis, it's always it's always very symmetrical and very straight. Um, but there's you can actually see the remnants of a channel cut through the rings, but it's in, it's in a bit of a diag, so it's not like oh. straight on from the opening. It, it tilts to the side. But when when you when you go through the openings that, that the geologist pointed out to me, it it ends in a big circle that would have been an inner harbor on on the inside. Yeah. So, okay. okay that, so now we got two really good measurements. Plus we know we've got one center Island and then the concentric rings of uh, ocean and water. We've got the mountains, we've got the opening. Um, he says that, uh, Oh, and this is one, one of the criticisms is he says, he says that the Atlanteans on the rings, they cut openings for the boats and they built bridges over them. Mm. Okay. And, and he says that the breadth of those openings on the outer ring was three stadia, the middle ring was two, and the inner uh, island was one stadia. Now, when he says breadth, which is how it's translated, breadth from an engineering standpoint, this is some of the background that I bring, is a very specific thing. So you, you, when you're digging trenches, you talk depth and breadth. And when you're, when you're planning topology, you talk length and width. So what's happened is 
uh, Team Azores has said, well, if, if he said that the breadth was uh, three stadia, which is 1,800 feet, so that's, that's not how big the opening was for the bridge. That's how far apart the rings were, which is completely wrong. Um, mm. When you look at the Rishat structure, though, there's an opening cut right where this canal starts. And, and, and how many feet across do you think it is? 1,800. Just what Plato says. And yeah. then when you follow the 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 um, the line, what looks like a trench was dug, and you get to the second ring, there's an opening of, of 1,200 stadia, just like he said. And then it leads oh. right, right to the Inner Harbor. So again, so it matches it perfectly. Um, he says there were a lot of elephants. Well, this part of Africa, especially during this time period, had a lot of elephants. Um, it, when you look at, there's a, uh, I don't have it in front of me, I should have brought it, but there was a big river. That, so that you had Lake, you had uh, Lake Chad, which at this time period was the, one of the biggest freshwater lakes on the planet. It's because of all the rain. And it is to the east of where this location is in Mauritania. And then a big river flowed from it, through it, through the, this Rishat structure thing to the sea. So we have a yeah. river and a waterway. Um, and you can see the, the remnants of it, you know, from, um, from space in the satellite images. So we have oh, that. Like Google, you can go like on Google earth and kind of yep. see some of it. Yep. He has all that. Wow. He, he says that um, the Atlanteans were like, Big in agriculture, like big, 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 big time in agriculture. He says that there were 60,000 10 by 10 stadia farms that, that were worked. And each one of the farms had to, you know, send supplies and, and you know, people to be warriors and, and all that stuff. But so what we want to find, so then we want to find signs of ancient agriculture. And, and I've actually found out this, I, no one knows this. I'm going to hint at it here, but we have found two spots um, where, uh, it's very clear that, that that substantial canals were dug massive, big on a big, big, big scale. One one is ten miles to the north of, of Rishat, which would have been where the mountains were, so on the other side of the lake, and then one is to the south, which would have been down that waterway some. And hmm. Atlantis was destroyed, sunk into the sea in a day and a night. Uh, we think if you look at this location, I don't know how the tsunami happened, but it's it's clear it was a tsunami. We talk about that that plane. I talk, you know, and it's it's about. Th- 3,000, 4,000 feet above sea level. When you yeah. measure the slope of that, it's like 0. 0.003, which is a perfect lake. And there are many lakes up. There's a lake up the Missouri River that's the same way, way inland. So it, it, all that makes sense. But a tsunami of 500 feet would reach the Rishat. The highest recorded tsunami we know of is 1,700 feet, which would obliterate it. And if it was sitting on a volcano, which it was when all that water hit, it would have yeah. been exactly what... Um, uh, Plato described, but then what we have on the site is salt. We've got tons and tons and tons of salt. But what's we're, we're very lucky, and this is some of the stuff that we're going to go dig up in uh, October, and and this will be in my next book. But in these in those agriculture places I was talking about, what happens is all the topsoil got blown away during the tsunami, and, and Plato actually tells us that too. Uh, but um, when the water evaporated, it left all the salt. Hmm. Right. So there's t- and, and how does Mauritania make its money right now? Salt mines. Whole place is covered in salt mines. Yeah, I'm, then, looking, I'm looking at the map right now of uh, where am I yeah. going here? Let's see. Well, so, so let me finish. So, so what happened with salt is as the water evaporates, the salt forms. Now, the 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 um, the terrain or the, the the climate changed, so it became you know it became a desert. So now we've got salt caking over some of it, you know, three and four feet thick, caking <laughs> over all this ancient agriculture. Yeah. Then what happens is when it evaporates over thousands of years, it forms what they call evaporites. And those are the kind of rocks we see covering all these canals. And then, and then these canals are now under the sand. So they've, huh. been, they've been preserved. Yeah. We're, we're, we're incredibly lucky. They've been, they've been preserved. So now we can go look at them um, and we'll be able to, you know, l- get a feel for some of this agriculture stuff. Because terrace farming showed up in the Atlas Mountains very, very, very early. Terrace farming is big now. And I think what we see around this Atlantis place is kind of proto-terrace farming. They're clearly able to move water. Um, and, it, and it fits. Plato tells us those 60,000 farms were in, on a plane that was 2,000 by 3,000 by 2,000 by 3,000 stadia, which comes out to like 10,000 stadia, which is like, I don't know how many miles that is. That's whatever that is. It's, it's a, over 1,000 miles. And, and the plane the plane in Africa, the, yeah, the plane we found these on is, is equally big enough. In the book, I measure it like five different ways. Um, it, but we're dealing with something that's big enough uh, you know, to, um, to, to have exactly what he said they have. And we found the canals, uh, which is, is incredible. Wow. So, yeah, th- this place yields us a lot of uh, information. Huh. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, I was like, you know, something, let me, 
let me get some visuals here and uh, open up Google. It's not Google Earth, but it's just Google Maps and stuff. And I'm looking at uh, the it's area kind of. of yeah, yeah it's, it's very famous. And the internet is very kind to it. There's a, a ton of information out there. Most of it you have to ignore. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, I tell people the problem with one of the problems with Atlanta is it's beaten to death. Mm. People, you know, they, they just like I said, they, they, they get half truths about it and then they make stuff up and kind of run with the point that goes nowhere. So, for example, Plato doesn't mention death crystal rays anywhere, but death crystals has become a big part of Atlantis, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Huh. Um, right. So w what are the thoughts now as far as its demise? Like, where did it go? When, how long did it take for it to just disappear? I think what happened is exactly what he said happened. He, he tells us that uh, they had to dig uh, canals, that, that one channel I was talking about, 100 feet deep. Well, that and, and, you know, just like in Florida, you know this, when it rains, you get silt. And if it rains yeah. for, for decades or, or, or thousands of years or, or centuries anyway, you get tons of silt. So if they had to dig their, the, the waterways out so the boats could get through and they had to dig down, dig down 100 feet, then we know we had at least 100 feet of topsoil. That's what silt is, silt, silt's topsoil. Yeah. So um, and then he tells us that after the cataclysm, that there was a shawl of mud that blocked the, the, the previous waterway. That went to get there. So when you look on the map, a matter of fact, and I want to get up, I want to make sure I mention there's there's two corroborating sources. One of them is a map. I'll do that one first, real quick, because it because it answers this question of where it went. So when you look, when if you just look where you're looking, if you look about halfway ish between where the eye is and where the uh, Atlantic Ocean is, you'll see some mounds, uh, mounds of dirt. Basically, it's just mud. It, it's mud. I think that's where a lot of it went. Uh, which lines up with what he tells us. And then we have this map. So let, let's talk about some corroborating sources and, and dig deeper into where did Atlantis go because we have a map that highlights that same um, uh, geological feature, just the big mounds of mud about halfway between. Yeah. And this is a very famous map. So in Graham Hancock's book, um, Fingerprints of the Gods, 1995, it opens with this map. Um, it's called the uh, Piri Reese map. Have you heard of that, Piri Reese? That does sound familiar. Yeah. yeah. If, if, you, if you saw it, you'd, you'd recognize it. We, we've all been staring at it. And the thing with the Piri Reese map, it was made in 15, uh, 1530-ish, I think, which is about 30 years after the discovery of the New World. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're only, we're only talking a couple, a couple decades. Yeah. Um, and the map, uh, so Piri Reese was an Ottoman navigator. And that, what that means is he was the guy with the map that got on the boat and helped them get where they were going. So some people say, well, he could have had him draw whatever map you want. It's like, no, he, he, was, he wanted a serious map. And so he went and he commissioned a map uh, from all of the ancient map sources that the Ottomans had. He commissioned a cartographer to put them all into one map so he had some sense of the whole globe. And no one, and this is not disputed. Everyone, everyone agrees this, and they agree the Piri Reese map. Now, there's some argument to how accurate those early maps were and how far back they went. But but here's the conundrum. So we're talking 30 years, uh, 36 years after the New World was discovered. We have this Piri Reese map based on ancient historical maps that seems to show all of the coastline of North America, Cuba, South America, very accurately, way more accurately than was known at the time. Yeah. Um, it also seems to show the continental shelf, because remember, the water's lower. We're in an ice age. Uh, the continental shelf between South America and uh, antarctica hmm. and it seems and when you look at it it's very it looks like it i mean it, it it's it's accurate so so everyone has been gyrating and arguing about the left side and the bottom side of the map forever and there's arguments both ways and i can go into them um on the right side of the map we've all been staring at this all i was I, I bought a copy of this thing like in 1997 or something after i read hancock's book um yeah. and i've been staring at it for, for 20 30 years whatever it is yeah. uh but it show on the right side it shows africa and when you look at Africa, you see the shawl of you, you see a river going up where where this Atlantean river would have been. You see the shawl of mud blocking it. And then right where the eye of the Sahara is, you see this kooky little city surrounded by a ring of water um, exactly where we think Atlantis was. So yeah. that, that's corroborating because at the time the map was drawn, uh, the Sahara was what it is today. It was just desert. And Piri Reese, you know, he's he's not going to settle for someone to draw him a map. It'll get him killed. He's going they're gonna try and sail up a river that doesn't exist into the middle of the Sahara Desert when and think it's you know you know what I mean. So whatever that was based on, that's 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 a memory of when there was something there. Um, yeah. 
So, th so that corroborates what, what Plato said. And, and the other thing that P Piri Reese did, or whoever drew the map did, is they drew a giant elephant <laughs> right, <laughs> right in the same spot. But Plato yeah. tells us that that um, that uh, Atlantis was there was t elephants everywhere. Uh, the other thing that the Piri Reese map does is it shows where today there's nothing. It's just the Sahara Desert. He draws a bunch of green mountains. Well, Plato tells us that Atlantis was known for the the whatever it is the the, the beauty and niceness of its green mountains, whatever it is. So we're seeing uh, geographical characteristics on this Priory's map that seem to support the, that what Plato said was going on was going on, and it also it aligns to everything. But we I found, and this is kind of well known, but it hasn't been as strongly um, associated with Plato. Is there was a Greek historian called Herodotus. And he was he's kind of viewed as the 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 father of history, the, the grandfather of history. He was the first um, person who it seems like at least in Western uh, culture that really tried to write down like a, an objective history of what was going on. Now, he was Greek and he had a Greek view. But but the way the histories works, and it's a huge, huge book. The first third or so is him kind of writing down what he knows about all the places. So what he knows about Egypt, what he knows about the Persians, you know, what he knows about Turkey, what he knows about Libya, what he, all, all that stuff. Um, and then, and it's kind of like a travelogue. So it's like you go to Egypt and then you go west through Libya for 10 days and you find these people and you go 10 more days and you find these people and then 10 more days. And now you're at the, the base of the Atlas mountains. So, so it's all that kind of stuff. Then the yeah. second two thirds is what the Greeks were doing and it, you know, the, the Persian invasion, all that stuff. But in that first part, and on lines one, like, shoot, it's like 185, 186, something like that. It's, it's, it's toward, very towards the beginning of the book. He says, you go to Egypt, then you go west into Libya then for 10 days, and you go 10 more days. Then you run into these people who call themselves the Atlanteans. Hmm. Now, now, he spells it differently. The translation spells it like with an, with an I instead of an E or something. So when yeah. you search on it, it doesn't show up. You, you have to search for like Atlas and, and then find it. But, it, but it's, the word, it's the word Atlanteans. But I think a lot of people have missed it because – you know, we're also internet savvy. We search, you don't see it. You know, we don't, we don't spend any more time with it. <laughs> yeah. But, but he says, yeah, he says the Atlanteans, they lived in these salt piles um, from this place in Libya. I talked about all the way to the base of the Atlas mountains. And he says that these people were really weird. Uh, he says that they refused to write anything down. Um, they had names and they would tell you the names, but they wouldn't let you write it down. And they didn't keep a history of themselves. Um, they were vegetarians. Uh, they didn't dream, whatever that means, and they wow. spent they spent their days cursing the sun. Hmm. Now, people interpret that say, "Oh, well, they were in the desert, and it must be hot, so they're cursing the sun." Okay, yeah. maybe. Yeah. But if we're talking about the Younger Dryas, where a tsunami, the Earth cr crust shifted, sh shifted, or a comet hit the water, or whatever, it would look like the sun was doing some funny things. So, I, I think it's a cultural memory of them cursing the sun, which you find in in other places too. That I mean, all of the Mesoamerican even the mainstream view of them is, is, you know, you have the hitching post of the sun. You have all these things that are aligned to day and night and what the sun's doing, the solstices and all of that. So culturally it fits in, but it very specifically says Atlanteans. Then if you look on a map and you figure a tsunami came in and hit the city and kept going into Africa and, you know, people survived there in the mountains, that, like everyone doesn't die. Where do you end up? You end up exactly where Herodotus tells us these people are that call themselves Atlanteans. Now this isn't, th this is like, um, he, he was writing, I think in, uh, 500 ish BC for 480 BC, 460 BC. So he's talking about, you know, stuff from 500 BC, 600 BC. Um, so we're thousands of years away from the Atlantean myth. Um, but, but culturally, you know, we still have people that call themselves Egyptians, you know, we, we, we culturally the name has stuck enough and we have a, a, a an independent historical reference of the name that fits perfectly with the story that is told around the Rishat structure in Atlantis. So, it, so those are those between the map and Herodotus, those are two independent pieces of primary source corroboration for what Plato tells us about Atlantis. Yeah. Now, now I see exactly what you're talking about. Cause I see the rings. I mean, it stands out like a sore thumb. Doesn't I'm it? Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, uh, <laughs> and his, the interesting thing, it was it was only discovered through satellites because yeah. when you're on ground and, and we've got hours and hours and hours, days of footage, you cannot make this structure out. Matter of fact, there's all kinds of forts. The French Foreign Legion was all over this place. Um, and there's all kinds of forts uh, built around it. It's a huge area, you know, I mean, yeah. it, uh, um, but no, it, 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 it fits. Um, it, it fits perfect. It, it, like I said, it fits perfectly. And the measurements fit, too. 
and if and if you don't dismiss, if you literally have to hit everything Plato says, this is the only place on the planet that hits it all. Yeah, he, I'm seeing you know, the places, ancient the ancient foundation. It's that square with these and, like weird blocks on the outside. It, it's uh, and, and and here here is um, here is what Plato tells. This is another line that is never referenced by people hunting for because it doesn't doesn't help anything and he's actually he's talking about well what what does what does the land look like after one of these cataclysms and yeah. here's what he says he says the earth has fallen away all around and sunk out of sight the consequence is that in comparison of what was of what then was there are remaining only the bones of the wasted body as they may be called as in the case of small islands all the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away and the mere skeleton of the land being left and when you look at the rich structure that is all foundation it, that is the skeleton of what was there. And then yeah. it, it's, in a, it's in a big lake, 10 miles on either side. It opens to the south. It's got mountains to the north. Um, it, it, it has all the ge geological features, hot and cold water. Uh, it has the, the canals we found. It's the right distance from the sea. Uh, and it goes on. I mean, and, and, and I do this in the book. And then we also, Plato gives us dimensions of the continent. And I go through all of that. We're going to run out of time. But th this part of West Africa fits perfectly with the idea of a continent in Plato's time. Um, and then you have the kingdom like we talked about. So, and, and this is it. And we found, and we know people were there and we found the tools uh, and we know 9,600 BC is 400 years after agriculture started. So, so why wouldn't they be good at agriculture? And as you can see, if you zoom out, it's, it's incredibly well protected. You can't, oh, yeah. you, you, no one can attack it. Um, it's good for commerce because it has a, a river coming up to it. But if you, if you know, you can shut the river down, um, yeah, you know, animals and stuff it's a very safe place on an island i mean it's like it's perfect if, if look if if i were living back then i would want to live there oh uh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah now as far as topography you, know, mm -hmm. you can't really see much as far as the topography from a, a satellite image but how deep is the actual ring structure compared to the general landmass around it yeah, and you can if you go on to uh, Google Earth instead of the the flat map, you can hold the middle mouse down and kind of move up and down. And there's also a bunch of what they call them e, mm. ESRI, whatever the topology um, yeah. files are. There's there's tons of those. Many people have done a lot of a lot of work on this. Uh, huh. What you're looking at, you, you're looking at you, you, from the bedrock. You know, you are looking at um, uh, the rise of the. Uh, the land immediately around it, it you know, uh, varies from not very much to a couple hundred feet. Uh, yeah. the, the thing is, when you add a hundred foot of um, topsoil to it, uh, you know, it can it can drift a little bit in, in how it presents, but it presents about perfectly. Hmm. And if you zoom really, really deep, you see the trident of Zeus <laughs> off to the uh, the west. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. You, you must be on a different uh, version, though. Yeah, Google Earth and I'm yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people put people put markers around it. Well, if you're looking at it, I don't, it's hard to do in this format. But if you look to the southern part of the mm -hmm. outer circle, you'll see a gap, and that gap is 1,800 feet. That's when I was telling you about it, and it, where the canal went in. Uh, oh, okay. So, I mean, I'm telling you, it, it measures up. The other criticisms I mentioned, people say it's too big, but that's because they don't understand bridges, you know, built over the rings as opposed to between rings. Yeah. Um, the uh, oh oh this is a big one. It's, the, one of the criticisms is that Plato says that the way to Atlantis was also the way to the opposite continent, hmm. and people think that this doesn't line up well for that. He says you you exited the Strait of Gibraltar, and then um, you followed uh, the um, the coast, and uh, there's a bunch of islands and stuff, and then you hit Atlantis, and you keep going, and pretty soon you're at the opposite continent. And the people that think it's the Azores, their their argument is. Well, you know, if you, you, you go straight out, which is a very mm -hmm. modern viewpoint because we're looking at maps and we want to go straight. But if you go straight, the Azores are almost halfway. But it's just not how people it's, it's not how boats worked in 9600 B.C. or 1300 B.C. or 600 B.C. or even 400 A.D. If, if sailors could get where they were going and keep land in sight. Yeah, that, that's how they worked. And I don't think we had anything in 9600 that could sail straight across the Atlantic like like Columbus did. Um, instead, if you look at the the, 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 the tidal currents, um, they push they take you right down the coast of uh, Africa um, through the Canary Islands and all the stuff me, meeting exactly as he described it. They take you right to the mouth where the mouth of this opening would have been. So you can then hoof it up to Atlantis if you want. Or if you keep going, you come off the coast of West Africa. And then if you look at a map, 
what's the shortest distance to get over to the opposite continent? You know, the, it's not North America, it's South America. It's, yeah. it's where the set tip of South America takes out. The, the currents take you there. And we, one of the things I say in the book is we can't have seen that these people were idiots. So why would you sail off into the middle of the ocean and hope when you could just ride the currents, keep land in sight, and then take the shortest distance between Africa and South America? It's what you would do. It, it's, how, it's how it would work. So the, the fact that Lance is on the way to the opposite continent you know, it's not a criticism as it's laid out. It's, it's, it, it supports it. And all yeah. of these, it's elevation supports it because we're, we're talking about rain. So water evaporates from the sea, goes up into the clouds, goes over land, over mountains, it rains, comes down, creates rivers, rivers go back to the ocean. Right. So it all, it all fits. It, it, even the criticisms are actually strengths. There, there's also been thoughts that, um, and I've heard this through uh, a couple of researchers that Atlantis could have been a lot, a lot bigger than, than, we think that possibly bigger than the largest continent that we see today on this planet. Yeah, no, look, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Pla- well, here's what Plato tells us. He says it was bigger than um, Asia Minor and Libya. Now, Asia Minor is basically Turkey. That, that's what, when, when the Greeks talked about Europe or, or mm-hmm. Asia, they talked about Turkey because that's where the Persians were. Yeah. Um, and then Libya what they would have thought of as Libya would have stretched farther to the west to, towards Morocco, but not as far in. But if you just take take those two countries, Turkey and Libya, the, their combined square mileage is like 998,000 square miles. And he says it was bigger than that. So if you look at a map and you look, if you're looking at a map of West Africa, you've got the Atlas Mountains to the north that come out of the Strait of Gibraltar. And then in by Chad and the, the eastern side of Mali, there is a mountain range that curves all the way around this plain that, that would have been where Atlantis was. And when you measure all that, it comes to about twice as big as Libya and Turkey, about just under two million square miles, yeah. uh, which fits perfectly with, with what he said. It, that, it, that fits his description. And there's no other landmass that's two million square miles that disappeared. You know, what, what they want, what they want is they want to say the Atlantic Ridge that it has very thin uh, crust and that uh, a big ice cap on the North Pole and all that, the, the Arctic would have pressed the land down, which would have meant that it pressed the land up in the middle of the uh, Atlantic, and it, that was a continent. And then when the ice melted, the, uh, uh, the displacement switched and the land went back down. Hmm. And it's like, first off, no, no one, no one buys that. that. That isn't true. It's just not true. There, there's no scientific support for that. It, to have it happen, the ice cap would have had to come down within 500 miles of where the Azo, Azores are, yeah. which is part of, so it'd be covering part of this land. It just, it's just, it's not possible. Um, and even the people that believe it, it's always preferenced by this is ge- geographic heresy, heresy, but you know, it's like, well, okay. So that doesn't work. And, and, he, and someone has to tell you that's Atlantis. They have to explain it to you and you have to go, oh, I buy it, but there's no way to prove it. You just believe it. Um, like, like you believe you know, Diet Coke has less calories than regular Coke. We hope it, <laughs> hope it does. Um, yeah. But with the Rishab structure, everything I've said, you can, anyone can go look at and you can do your own measurements and you can read Plato yourself. Um, and some people want to interpret some of the way I've interpreted Plato. Some people want to interpret it differently, but that doesn't, so what? They, we can interpret things differently all we want. It doesn't make one interpretation more or less um, accurate than the other. And the advantage I have with my interpretation is it's 100% accurate to the translation and it fits 100% a real place. So yeah, 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 a place you can actually see, you can measure it, you you can, yeah, you can collect we, the data. We can collect the data, and people can look. You can see the tools that, that they found from the civilizations that were there. You can read what Plato said. Yeah, you can research the Younger Dryas. You can research the Green Sahara. You know, I mean, you go look it all up. It's all 100% pure science. Um, and I show all my work in the book. Uh, and you know, and so if someone wants to disagree with something, and it frustrates a lot of people because they they want to disagree philosophically and abstract and try and argue. It's like, well, hold on, pick, pick a piece of data and, you know, and show me on the doll where it hurt you. You know, I mean, where, um, you know, what do you, do? And, they, and, and they can't because it all lines up. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah. why I said, you know, that's why I said land is solved. I, I mean, this that's, is it, this is it. Yeah. This is, it's the only place in the universe that matches Plato's descriptions. 99.36%. That's, and that's my observation too, is, it seems like, especially when it comes to like the um, the Bermudas and you know out in the you know the Caribbean, where a lot yeah. of people have have thought yeah, that that's where it's at, that's where it was, and that's where it's always going to be. Um, it seems like 
we have this we want to hijack ourselves and continuously want to chase after something that we can't get data from we just it's just lost hope <laughs> you know no, and look and we're hoping and, and with atlantis we, we know there were nine provinces and we have so we have the frenetic names for them so i i think i think i can we can find cuba and the bimini islands in there we can find any of the azores we can find spain all these places people like but that don't really match like literally but they they feel like there's enough evidence to show there was some advanced society maybe agriculture going on yeah i think they're candidates for for being the kingdom of, of yeah atlantis. part of the yeah part, part of, of the, the outer kingdom. kingdoms yeah and this yeah. idea that yeah we want it to be the azores um so it can't be this other thing it's like well, why can't it be both why, why can't you know we look at the story for real and yeah. see how it see how it all fits together yeah i mean it's not that far i mean come on <laughs> yeah, they got boats and, and if you look at the way the the, the ocean uh, tide works is like i said it takes you off off africa takes you over to the tip of um south america and then you can ride that all the way up to to connecticut if you want to yeah. um so it doesn't mean they can't get there uh, and it doesn't mean like there wasn't something big going on near Bimini. I, I don't you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it, none of those, the existence of those places do not detract from where the capital was and where Plato tells us it was, which is yeah. this Rishat structure thing. Huh. Wow. Man, yes. you've, got my, you've, Found. you've got my mind going, man. It's, it's uh, now yeah, actually it, seeing it. It's like, whoa. It's like, I, it's like, um, it, but what but what you're experiencing, I've experienced that it's 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 like Christmas presents. You know, like when we were little kids <laughs> and you got yeah. a couple presents under the tree and you stare at them for two or three weeks and you're not allowed to open in them and you dream about what could be in there. Yeah. And that's just the best time. And then when you open them, okay, it's great. You got socks and an undershirt and new pair of pajamas, <laughs> you know. And, yeah. and it's been when you're appreciative and you've learned not to show disappointment, you know, all that stuff, but it's not the same, it's not exciting. It it, it can't be anything anymore. It's it's whatever it was. And that's what we have here. We, we have, um, it, it's what it is now. It, it, it's something that fits in. It, it, there are no, you know, uh, death ray crystals or any. It, now, let me speculate. I know we're almost out of time, but I want to speculate. So everything I've said that where I didn't say I was speculating, I, you know, I think it's true. I think it's real, scientific. Yeah. I think what happened, I, I think that, that these cataclysms, whatever it is that wipes out civilizations, I, I think they happen on some frequency. I don't know what it is. There's a root, some sort of a routine for it. There's some sort of a routine for it. Plato talks about this at length, by the way, in other dialogues that it was mm -hmm. well known. Um, so I think for this particular time, I think they got caught um, unprepared, and but but enough people survived. Egypt survived, and so I think that this 9600 time period, a couple hundred years after, maybe that's when we start to see these civilizations. And I think here's their thought process. I think they're like, you know, we've got to preserve enough knowledge. So that after this, when people come back, they're not starting over like we started over. Mm. And so how do you do that? Well, if it's if it's something that is involves earthquakes and 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 shifting and the planet tilting, because you know the planet tilts to 23 degrees, which makes no sense. It's four billion years old. Whatever it is, what how do you combat that? You build the biggest darn things you can think to build, which is what we see. And when you push the pyramids back to when they were probably built, when you, when you go to um, Peru and the Aztecs and all that stuff, uh, Tiwanaku, the yeah. foundations are giant, giant stones. And I think that's that first foundation. So I think like, you know, we, we want to try and preserve it. And I think that's when you look at, uh, oh, here, here's the key example. Um, astrology. You ever heard of astrology? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not, it's not astronomy, but it used to be. Um, and astrology is supposed to have come from, you know, early times. And the, the only message that survived for astrology, which has now obviously become its own thing, is that, um, what is it? The, uh, the stars and heavens, uh, have a impact on the, the something of man, you know, the, uh, the, the fruitfulness of people, whatever that is, yeah, so, yeah. which is now what we've interpreted that as is, okay, if you were born in March, you're a Pisces and Jupiter's in your house of whatever. So you like the color blue and you, and you don't like deep bananas. But what it's really <laughs> saying is the heavens affect us here. And yeah. if, if you think about, you know, what messages so above, can you get? So below. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah. So what messages can you get through? Those, those are the kind of messages that are going to survive. And then I think you look at Egypt, um, specifically the pyramids and stuff. I think that is them going for it. 
because it looks like there's this cataclysm stuff then also looks like there's something to do with the sun where maybe there's solar flares or it'll get hot Mm-hmm. Um, you know, burn stuff or whatever. And if you look at the pyramids and, and a lot of the stuff that was built in Egypt, it's massive amounts of stone. Um, many people think the pyramids were power plants, right? That was some, something to do with water and power plants. My theory, I'm speculating, it's got nothing to do with the book. Um, I have no proof for this. I think that's a drainage system. And I think they built the biggest damn building they could build. It's protected from uh, solar flares coming down because there's a ton of... Um, stone and it's also protective water coming up it's got a good drainage system and in the very middle of it a big friggin box where they could have put whatever it is they wanted to, to be passed on to the next group of people yeah um and that by the way explanation fits perfectly with all of the evidence too by the way because there's never been in, in any substantial pyramid there's never been you know a mummy found there's been mummies yeah, found no in mummies have ones. ever been found yep. so, so what the hell yeah. is it is it is it a power plant I mean, we, we would have to find some type of infrastructure to get the power out of the pyramid and to, uh, you know, to the, to the people to use it. Is it a water processing plant? I've seen that. I was like, sure, but we'd have to find pipes. <laughs> we kind of find the pipes going to the fountains in the middle of the city. We don't find any of that. Instead, yeah. we find these things they call sarcophagus, which are foot or two feet or in some case, four feet, four feet thick granite oh. stone, right? Perfectly sealed in the middle of these giant impenetrable buildings. I'm telling you, if I, if I had to put my iPad somewhere to survive one of these, that's where I'd want to put it. <laughs> yeah. But that's all speculation. That That's just, and I think Atlantis kicked all that off. And what I think then we, we now see is, you know, the, the foundation of that. And of course the knowledge is lost a little bit, but they kept trying and trying and trying. And then other civilizations came and built back on top of, because if you find one of those places, this is Brian Forrester's basic theory is they're pretty cool places. Why wouldn't you, why would you just walk by it and then go build a village oh, three miles down yeah. the road? Yeah. Yeah, you'd want to stay there. I was like, well, I'm staying here. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, half the work is already done. Yeah, exactly. Use you yeah, use what use the tools and use the uh the foundation you already have and just you know keep building on it. Yeah. I mean, you look at Turkey, Istanbul. I mean, a lot of Istanbul, a lot of that ancient city is there's like cities and cities and cities and layers. Yeah. Yeah. Under that, under other end under Istanbul. It's even, you know, we were talking earlier before we started recording. I lived in Colorado for a long time. And you go into those mountain towns and there's maybe a third generation building built on the foundation of something that was just built 200 years ago. Wow. It's just part of it. We're like ants. It's just part of how we how we do things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So huh. Atlantis, Atlantis solved. Heck yeah. Woo. <laughs> yep. I, uh, I definitely want to have you back on and maybe kill a kill a few more hours and talk about some of your other work. Um, okay. Definitely. Yeah. I'm a, and, I'm a, um, maybe I'm a... answer some of the questions that we might have after this broadcast, uh, after the premiere and stuff like that. And maybe kind of touch it. I, I love to answer questions. I mean, you know, I obviously I, I can blather on and kind of tell my story, but it, it's much more interesting for me to, to have people ask specific questions and then together to see if we can figure out if it fits or not. Yeah, definitely. Now where can, uh, where can people find your book? So the publisher is Frequency99, and so the website's Frequency99.com. Uh, you can go there, uh, or it's on Amazon. Um, just search for uh, Atlantis Solved and my name, David Edwards. I, Atlantis Solved will probably bring it up. It's done. It's done okay. I, I was when it first came out, I was ahead of Graham Hancock's new book for like two weeks, um, but then he has what they call legs, and I don't have legs. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. it's doing okay. It's doing. It's doing all right. There's got. Um, some good reviews and some re- my favorite reviews for the book are some lady i don't know who she is uh, she said that uh, it's written like he's a pompous kindergartner who can't string two coherent sentences together but by god when i was done if he didn't prove that this place was atlantis <laughs> i'm like that's <laughs> perfect you know right they, yeah. they she's not buying me she's not buying the writing style but she bought the context of it yeah. because it does lay out a very like i said it, the way the case is built is it's frustrating for people that don't want to agree with it because they got to tackle 50, you know, specific pieces of data versus the theory. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Man. All right. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, yeah. Stay on, uh, stay connected. That way I can uh, give you some information after, uh, okay, after, sure. uh, after we're done. But um, anyway, Dave, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And, um, very astounding information. I'm sure. Th- I'm sure um, we'll have uh, a lot of bites on this, and a lot of uh, a lot of viewers on this when the premiere goes. When it, yeah, when the premiere goes in, 
And um, again, for those who are listening, those who are going to be watching, su subscribe to the YouTube channel. And um, other than that, I do appreciate it. Thank you for watching un uh, Unlocking Mysteries of the Universe. Until then, until next time, y'all take care.